بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده Dear respected viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another brand new episode of the program entitled Towards the Origin. And to all of those who will be joining us now or later through our YouTube channel, Facebook page and live streaming via our channelist webpage. As Muslim, we all know our role and responsibility towards our beloved mother. We even have by-hearted the hadith which we have learned in the childhood, that is, paradise lies beneath the feet of our mother. So what about our mother-in-law? What status does she have in Islam? Is it the equal status that is there, with, uh, that is exactly the same as our beloved mother? And what right does she have in order, what it means, and what right does she have in her children's marital life or how much does she can contribute all of this and many more inshallah we'll be discussing in our tonight's program therefore our program title is mother-in-law in islam and to discuss this topic we have with us a very renowned scholar who is a graduate from Al-Adhar university egypt he is a respected imam and khatib and in fact the first bangladeshi origin in the london central mosque and the islamic cultural center famously known as regent's park mosque sheikh qadi lutfur rahman assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh First of all, as usual, thank you very much for being here so late in the studio at night. It's my pleasure. May Allah bless you and reward you as well. Jazakallah khair. Now, I would like to start with our first question for tonight will be, the topic is very, it's, it's not that something that you commonly hear. It's not something that people commonly discuss. Right. Um, now, what is the purpose of selecting this topic? Good question. الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أكمل لنا ديننا وأتم علينا نعمته ورضي لنا الإسلام دينا اللهم رضينا بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد after praising Allah and sending salam and salutations to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, I testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. And I also testify that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the final messenger and slave of Allah, the Almighty. Now the topic, uh, mother-in-law in Islam, um, a very crucial important topic but uh, it is quite profound complicated as well as sensitive topic um, I uh, actually haven't seen anyone discussing um, on this specific topic uh, um, and uh, my beloved brother Kamar also um, posed a question what was the purpose or why did I choose this topic uh, for tonight's um, program now I have seen um, in the, uh, I have seen many people in the Eastern world or in the Muslim world or in some parts of the world, I have seen um, many people, uh, they consider their daughter-in-law as uh, a person who would be working at home, who would be doing um, a lot of uh, uh, cleaning and cooking at home. So this is one of the main uh, uh, things or main features that they will be looking into before they marry their sons with any um, uh, any any bride or any daughter. Uh, so I have seen that this is a tendency or mentality in many people in in many parts of the world. But at the same time, I have seen also in the uh, in the Western world as mainly, but also in any in in some other parts of the world that um, will find uh, that some of the daughter-in-laws. Um, would uh, would completely deny any rights or any kind of virtues of a mother-in-law um, uh, in Islam or in general uh, in general case. Um, just to add um, or just to clarify, I think it, it goes both ways. Sometimes exactly. we've seen in yeah. the other way around as well, son-in-law exactly. as well. Yes. So as I said, like I have seen people in the in the Eastern or in some of the Muslim world, the people have the mentality that the, the wives or the or the daughter-in-laws are merely. Uh, a cleaner or worker or generally somebody, within the subcontinent yes, we assisting, do notice, yeah. uh, towards the family that would be one of the main features which we looked looked into before uh, a marriage take place but at the same time i've seen many daughter-in-laws um in many parts of the world that they would completely deny the uh, the rights or virtues of a mother-in-law 
uh, in Islam or in general. So therefore, I thought it's quite important to discuss on that topic. Um, I have heard from many, many sisters saying that um, I don't have to do anything for my mother-in-law. So in, in the Western world, mostly we see when, uh, when a, a, a couple getting married, um, then they would say that I, I just uh, dedicate to my partner and my partner dedicates to me. I only devote to my partner. Anything else apart from the partners will most likely be um, uh, belittled or, or discarded. So, Is it because of the limited of knowledge um, that we have? I, I think it's, it's, it's more like a cultural issue, um, cultural thing. People uh, in, in, in some parts of the world, they would just think that if they get married with the husband, some sisters and the brothers would say if they get married with the, with the wives, then they don't have to have anything to do with the with the mother-in-law or the or the um, or the in-laws of of his uh, I mean of his wife. So those kind of mentalities are in our society. So it is very important to clarify this complicated issue, and therefore I was quite interested to talk on this subject. Uh, by the way, this topic uh, is not intended for daughter-in-laws only, uh, because some of our sisters may think, oh, we're just talking about them. But it's also intended for son-in-laws, because son-in-laws, they also have mother-in-laws. Correct. So it's not only for sisters, but it's also for brothers. So I think sisters can relax a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so the topic uh, is meant for son-in-law as well as daughter-in-law, because we have seen many son-in-laws also completely ignore um, to uh, contribute or to support or to show any kind of um, uh, uh, any relationship with the mother of, of his wife or with the brothers and sisters or the relatives of his wife. We have seen that tendency in some brothers. I know uh, one of my um, uh, relatives actually back home, he said, he said once that I never visit my, my in-laws. So I said, like, uh, you know, he said it I, with pride and arrogance. He's he he like. boasting. So he said, yeah. "Are you boasting?" He said, "Yes, I, I never visit my uh, my uh, in-laws." So it was kind of pride for him. But I was surprised that there are people like this in this world that they think they have no responsibilities towards um, their own in-laws. Very good question. It's not. It's, it's certainly prevalent within our society here as well. Now I want to slightly touch upon this. What do you think? Why would people have that sort of understanding that? they would say it in a boastful manner that they do not want to keep um, any relationship. Is it because of the bitterness that they had from the other side or um, is it in general lack of knowledge? Most likely it would be sometimes some people are nat by nature, they have this uh, lack of mercy and kindness. So uh, they would have the ego issue. So th at the same time, they will not have mercy and they will not have kindness. They will not have that lenience and softness um, um, that is required by Islam and which was one of the beautiful quality of Prophet Muhammad, qualities of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was gentle and kind and lenient. So yeah, that could be, there could be many other reasons, but uh, this is one of the main reasons. Now, uh, one of the uh, uh, important issue that some of us may think, we are talking about mother-in-laws only, but how about father-in-laws? Correct. Now, before I move mm -hmm. to the um, father-in-law mm -hmm. bit, I had a question to ask. Mo the hadith that we commonly know is paradise lies beneath the feet of the mother. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, our door to Jannah is our mother. Yep. But we don't hear so many hadith relating to our mother-in-laws. Mm. Yes. So Do you think it is because of that that people don't have a proper understanding, yes. as the way, yes. as the same way they have the understanding about their own mother? Yes. I'm coming to that point. Um, there is a bit of mis uh, mis um, uh, confusion and misunderstandings about this matter. But I'm coming to that point uh, slightly later. Uh, but just before that, I wanted to say that father-in-law. Now, some of us may think, well, we are discussing about mother-in-law and and and. Uh, position uh, from Islamic perspective but how about a father-in-law well uh, whatever will be mentioned for mother-in-law that will include father-in-law as well so it's it's equal and same so there's nothing more or less uh, regarding father-in-law as the equal so mother-in-law and father-in-law will be exactly same um, whatever will be mentioned um, now uh, you have mentioned about the evidence like uh, we don't find much clear evidence from the Holy Quran. When I say, yeah, when I say evidence, it's just we don't hear much, yes. as much as we hear you, you about the right. paradise lies beneath right. the feet of the mother. That's but what I mean. But one meant. thing that we must understand, that not everything in Islam, in terms of evidence, is black and white. Mm -hmm. So not all the evidences are black and white. We have some evidence, evidences are clear and plain. We have other evidences which are not clear, but they're indirect evidence, yet 
still they're considered by the scholars of Islam and they consider them as adillah, as the dalil or evidences in Islam. Now, I can give you an example like if someone comes and tell you what is the ruling of learning Arabic language? Mm -hmm. Now, you may say it's wajib. It, it's, it's, it's a compulsory thing <coughs> according to many scholars. Um, now, if I ask you, what is the evidence from the Quran to say that you have to learn Arabic? Is there any evidence from the Holy Quran and prophetic Sunnah? Is there any evidence? Well, the scholars of Islam, they say uh, an important ruling, especially the jurists, the lawyers in Islam, they say, ما لا يتم الواجب إلا به فهو واجب. So they said an important principle, ruling, and I, th I want everybody to listen very carefully, and that way will, things will be much more clearer to us. They say, without which an obligation cannot be fulfilled is itself an obligation. Without uh, which an obligation cannot be fulfilled is itself an obligation. Now, the scholar said, in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that seeking knowledge is compulsory. طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة. Seeking knowledge is compulsory upon every Muslim, male and female. Now, no one can learn the true knowledge of Islam, Quran and Sunnah, prophetic statements, without learning Arabic. So the Arabic is the gateway. So that's where this principle comes, without which an obligation cannot be fulfilled, is itself an obligation. مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ wajib. So, because we cannot learn the knowledge of Islam without Arabic, so therefore Arabic is also compulsory because it's it's a condition of seeking knowledge. So when you say it's compulsory, do you mean that is it compulsory when someone wants to enhance their understanding or at least if they have to do their basic element, which is the basic anybody, para If anybody wants to become a scholar of Islam, if then, anybody wants okay. to become a preacher, if anybody wants to become a da'i, then in order to have a basic understanding of the Quran and, and the prophetic statements, we need Arabic language. That's very true. And I think there are a lot of um, logical uh, concepts behind it. Because when you read the translation or when you read any commentary, you're actually reading it from the perspective of the writer. Exactly. Not, yeah. You're not deducing it you, from your own understanding. So it will be a secondary knowledge. And only that you can never taste the language because Arabic language is unique. And that's the reason why I have heard uh, from a great scholar of tafsir, commentator of the Holy Quran, Sheikh Mutawilla Sha'rawi Rahimullah, Rahimullah, a great scholar of, of 21st century or 20th century um, in Egypt, uh, who gave uh, the commentary of the whole Quran. He said that it is quite impossible for us to translate or interpret the Holy Quran. Exactly. But what we can do yeah. is we can bring people to the closest meaning of the Holy Quran. Because I think the element of uh, many people, um, especially our non-Muslim fellow non-Muslim brothers and sisters, have uh, the understanding that because the Arabic word can have so many different meanings, yes. and that's why the ulama, I think they say, it's almost impossible to exactly translate yeah. the glorious Quran. Uh, indeed, definitely, because because Arabic is much more is richer than any language that ever exists in this world. It's, it's, it's the language which was chosen for the Holy Quran, which was a miracle of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as a language, as a literature, as an art, as, as, as whatever you mean. I mean, obviously, that's a different topic. But um, uh, what I'm trying to say that not all the evidences in Islam is black and white. There are evidences that can be indirect, and there are evidences which are direct. So now let's look into the evidences of uh, taking care of, uh, of, of a mother-in-law or a father-in-law be it is for a daughter-in-law or for a son-in-law. I'm, I'm, I'm here talking equally for both. Um, and I hope uh, no uh, one will misunderstand me and no one will misinterpret me, um, uh, inshallah, and try and understand the matter from a very neutral and sincere point of view. Now, when we are married Islamically, we have some roles and responsibilities. And unfortunately, uh, uh, many of us, we have the tendency that when it's for me, then I am the seeker of the right. But mm. when it's, when it's, uh, when it's uh, against me, then I would say, no, I don't follow, or I try to give other interpretation or other explanation. Oh, that belongs to a different school of thought than e mine. E exactly. So we have a problems between amongst many brothers and sisters that when it's my right, then eh, it's Quran says, Sunnah says, Prophet says, Islam says, Sharia said. We bring all the evidences. But when it is my responsibilities, we do not look at those responsibilities according to Islam. And that's unfair, and that's, that's really uh, something that is uh, unfair in Islam, and uh, it's unfair generally. Um, 
So let's look into responsibilities of a husband in Islam, like primary responsibilities. Then we can understand if it is connected. Because some of the responsibilities are interconnected. You cannot really um, detach or disconnect because they're all interconnected, like cables. So, so when it's you all say, interconnected. So when you say responsibility, I work. It, it's like a two-way traffic. So yeah. it's not only one person has to fulfill the responsibility. No. In order for us to enjoy a better and happier family life, yeah. it has to be communicated from both these sides. Yes, because when two families come together, then the responsibilities become interconnected. They're all connected. We cannot say, I have no responsibility towards my wife. At the same time, I cannot say I have no responsibility towards my mother-in-law because she is the mother of my wife who is the closest person in my life at the, at the moment. So how can I say that I have no responsibility towards her? And at the same time, she cannot say, and she has no right to say that I have nothing to do with my mother-in-law, my shashuri or my hori. I have nothing to do with her and I have no responsibility because she is under the supervision or she is with uh, the closest person, her spouse and partner, who is the son of that mother-in-law, who was the cause to bring her husband to this world. And not only that, sometimes we find it very difficult to even understand a simple fact that a person, my spouse that I love so dearly, who is so close to my heart, but yet his or her own mother yep. is such an... Sometimes we act like as if they are enemy. Uh, that's, and that's, it, it works both ways yes, again. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, f unfortunately, the clash between mother-in-law and daughter-in-laws are eternal and it's, it's quite everlasting. It's been happening since the time and, human beings were born. And, and, and just, I've been hearing that, you know, from you know, generations after generations. And just, just to add on that, it's very, it's, I mean, it's very appropriate to add on that here. Most of the TV dramas are also, unfortunately, our neighboring country that produces are based on this whole concept of mother-in-law and um, daughter-in-law. And mm. it tries somehow to explain that who is superior, who is wrong yes. and who is bad. I mean, I, Do you I think believe, that sort of thing has an influence in our lives? I believe Islam can give the best um, solution to these kind of problems because uh, Islam is always balanced and moderate and it puts everything in perspective, as I always repeat. So Islam can give a good under... But the problem is, as I have mentioned, we are quite selfish at this time be it husband or wife, quite selfish. When it comes to my right, then I am the seeker of the rights and I will make sure that I'm getting my right. I'll scream for it. But when, it, when it's my responsibility, then... To I will giving give, the rights yeah, to others. To others, then, then I will give other explanations. So let's look into the responsibility of her daughter-in-law towards her mother-in-law. When we look at the right of a wife of a husband in Islam, number one is the financial maintenance. So a husband is fully responsible of the financial maintenance of his wife and his family and his children according to his financial capacity, capability. I mean, no one can push, but as much as he can, but he is responsible. So when I say that a husband is responsible for bills, for accommodation, for food, for treatment, according to his capacity, according to his, his capability. So Allah the Almighty said in the Holy Quran, in a verse, so Allah the Almighty says, let the rich man spend according to his means, according to his income, according to his, his, his uh, earning. And the man whose resources are restricted, meaning less, let him spend according to what Allah has given him. Allah puts no burden on any person beyond what he has given him. Allah will grant after hardship ease. So, in Namal, Usri Yusra. So, financial <coughs> responsibility is the responsibility of a husband in Islam. But, however, if the both parties have a mutual agreement, Islam also respects. An understanding. Yeah, Islam and acknowledge, like you say, oh, you take, you do half, I do half. That's not something wrong. It's, it's okay if both parties are happy with that. But uh, if it is a right, then it's the right of a wife or the children of a... And, and just to clarify, um, even if the wife wants to work within the parameters of Islam, she's um, allowed to work in Islam if she chooses to. Um, again, that's would that should be done, uh, frankly, or uh, if I said that should be done with the consent of a husband. If, if, the, if the husband and wife, they're both happy, then that's okay. Um, so, yeah, it is fine, permissible, as long as you know, she can maintain and manage her 
a religious as long as it religious doesn't what you're trying to say as long as as long as it does not create a conflict within the family, the family. or a reason yes. for them yes. to fall apart yes um now when Allah the Almighty gave, uh, made husband responsible for uh, the financial maintenance, in return he gave him something else, which is quite hard for many of us to accept, and, and many maybe sisters, they probably find hard to accept. But if someone is a true faithful and believer, then they wouldn't uh, you know, find it hard to accept this. So Allah the Almighty said in Surah An-Nisa, Al-Rijalu qawwamun ala nisa now this verse has been sometimes misinterpreted, or some of the or men misrepresented. They, or represent, yeah, some of the or men. Or the they, critics of Islam uses this verse yes, as yes. one of the tools to yes, malign so, Islam. And some men they took it as that they're ultimate leader and they're dictators and they can do whatever they like and there's no any say, there's no any opinion. No. So what does Allah say? Al rijal qawwamun ala nisa. Men are the maintainers and protectors of the women. And I like the word, uh, um, uh, I like the, the translation which was given by an, a contemporary scholar. The word, he says, men are the managers of the house, he said. Men are the managers of the house, because I like the word. Because when we say the leaders, then leaders can be dictators. Some Correct. of the leaders are dictators. So they're like, it's my way or no way, it's my way or highway. But uh, the... The managers in, in other words, the sole responsibility is on the yeah. men managers for, to are, look after his family. Managers are more like um, that they, they manage everything smoothly, properly. Uh, they console, they speak, they counsel, uh, uh, they talk to one another, each other, and then they take the best decision. Like shura, the concept of shura in Islam. وَأَمْرُهُمْ shura بَيْنَهُمْ وَشَابِرُهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ That you do shura before you do anything. That is the correct understanding of leadership in Islam. You mean shura with the family, with, with the, the family wife, members. consults with the family, yes. with the children, yes. and then makes a decision. And I normally say that a business, a small business, a small association, a small school, a small, uh, a small organization cannot be run without a manager. How can we expect to run a family which is the biggest institution in a society without a manager. And I see the problems lie under the quarreling over the managership. Who should be the leader of the house? So men, husband saying me, wife saying no, I am half 50-50. So people are fighting over because there's not any leader. And if there is any leader, then you see what happens. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, well, on that note, we've been listening to a very interesting conversation. It's time now for a short break. We'll be right back. Do stay, in with, do stay tuned with us. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in a few moments. You're watching Towards the Origin. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.